Hi, this is Stan Bush. Hi, this is Stephanie Calvert. This is John Payne. This is Jack Hughes. Hi, I'm Gary Stevens. Hey, everybody. This is Prescott Niles. Hello, I'm Kofi Baker. listening to play that rock and roll uh, this is a music show uh, so I have to ask one music question about WCW and I want to ask about what is probably the most infamous uh, element of WCW's music library and that is the bizarre use of sound alike tracks for various wrestler themes uh, Diamond Dallas Page with Self High Five, which sounds like smells like Teen Spirit. And... Self High Five. What was it? Rick Steiner had the the song that sounded like uh, Paradise City. When your research for this project, did you come across any sort of explanations for why these, of all things, were like the way their music department wanted to go, especially at a time when, you know, they were, you know, bringing in, well, they were much more successful um, than, than WWF, but WWF, you know, took a very different strategy for, you know, intro themes. Yeah, it's a great question. Um... It was quite quite interesting because you know you, you mentioned uh, the existence of a, a music department, and the you know there was no music department, right? There was no oh. WC, one of the, what, what what one of the things I think which uh, the book highlights is really the lack of infrastructure that WCW oh. had in compar in comparison to the WWF, right? So, gotcha. Essentially, the way it, essentially the way it would work is they would pick music or themes for wrestlers out of the Turner music production library, right? So that's why a lot of these tracks, if you look at it, are just labeled something generic like track one one fourteen or something like that, because a wrestler would, would come into uh you know the the production studio and uh, you know essentially they would play him a, a bunch of different songs that were already owned by Turner. And as you mentioned, you know, a lot of those songs were, to put it mildly, uh, very reminiscent of uh, <laughs> other 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 popular music that was out there, and and that's really a function of the fact that they, to my knowledge, were largely purchasing library music. So you know, this was music that was um, being put together in certain styles, or uh, was really intended to sound like you know some of the popular offerings on the market, but. Basically, a wrestler would come in, they would play a bunch of themes and, and you know, there was no kind of notion of we're going to go out and we're going to license, you know, this, this did happen later, granted, but for the most yeah. part, they weren't licensing, you know, music from, um, you know, actual known artists or doing what the WWF did, of course, which was, you know, having their own in-house um, music produced and tailor-made for each wrestler. And I, and I think just to kind of put a bow on this, because it is kind of an important question, because if you look at when the tide really started to turn and the WWF really took off in the ratings, a huge element, I would argue, in the overall presentation of that show and how exciting it was, was the theme music. You know, when the glass broke and Stone Cold came out and he's walking to the ring with a theme that absolutely perfectly suits his character, um, you contrast that to watching WCW, where at times you had even some of the most well-known wrestlers coming out to completely generic themes. Um, you know, we could get really technical here, but I, I think the the if you look at the the mixing or the the relative you know volume of um, the the theme music as compared to the the noise coming from the ring or noise coming from the crowd on the WWF shows the production quality was just so much higher compared to WCW, uh, especially towards the end where you could at times barely hear the music or hear even some of the dialogue between characters backstage. So these little things, you know, really added up, I think, and 
and added, you know, amounted to a perception which said WWF is the cool, you know, wrestling company and WCW is really uh, on the decline. That is an ab- spot on observation. You know, just going back through old clips, there is a very stark difference uh, in the usage of intro themes where, yeah, there's definitely like a production factor that the, the WWF had that WCW, especially in the, in the later years, just, just didn't, um, just didn't at the same level. Uh, but not to say that there wasn't any, wasn't any good music from WCW's, um, library. Are there, are there any wrestler themes in particular, you know, looking back on your fandom that you're partial to? Well, you know what, uh, now that you mention it, uh, that, that Goldberg, you know, theme, I remember, you know, watching as a, as a fan back then, that was always, that was always a highlight, you know, of course, his entire entrance as well. You know, what was interesting about that, you know, was, and I think we mentioned this in the book, once again, because that was a generic library cut, you know, WCW couldn't do anything with that music. They couldn't put it on a CD. They couldn't, um, they, they couldn't monetize that theme that they were playing, you know, uh, during the main event as many of its broadcasts because, once again, of the fact they were relying on uh, what music they had in-house. But that's, that's definitely one that comes to mind. That's crazy to me, especially because it comes from within Turner. Turner. 